Matilda Cortez, thank you very much for joining the Digital Markets Research Hub conversation series. It's a pleasure to have you. We have a very hot topic to discuss, the long-awaited Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill has been just released by the main governmental, which you are currently Deputy Director for Smart Data and Digital Markets, namely the Department for Business and Trade. So it's a governmental initiative. Obviously, we know that uh, it has been done in consultation with the Competition and Markets Authority uh, and of, of with other governmental departments. It's a very important topic, and it's really a great opportunity for me to ask you a couple of just very basic questions about, uh, about this paradigmatic <coughs> bill. Uh, it has been released just two days ago, so we all are very eager to learn more. And from what I hear uh, from some peers, most of my colleagues uh, are very excited, very uh, optimistic, and they uh, actually endorse in this uh, the very initiative, but also the mechanics of how it has been done. Some have expressed some, you know, uh, room for improvement, but that's probably what, what, what's normal legislative process and, and envisages. So without further ado, let me uh, first of all welcome you and uh, ask you maybe to just to introduce the, the, the main kind of provide outline of, of, of the initiative. Great, thank you very much for having me. Um, so yes, I'm the Deputy Director for smart data and digital markets. Um, I work in the Department of Business and Trade, and it's worth saying at the outset that this is a joint policy between the Department for Business and Trade and the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Um, so I should give all of my colleagues, as well as my team, all the credit um, for the work that we've done. Um, and we are really delighted um, that the bill's just been introduced and has got such a good reception. Um, so to sort of um, start with the, the um, main elements of the bill, I suppose it is also really worth mentioning that we've got some reforms here on the competition side um, for the kind of general competition regime that applies to the whole of the economy. Um, and then we've also got some uh, really exciting reforms to consumer policy, improving consumer enforcement powers um, and tackling sort of subscription traps. Um, for consumers. Um, the first part of the bill is this new pro-competition regime for digital markets. Um, so a bit of background is that, as you, I'm sure, will be um, incredibly aware, we've seen over the last few years how the, how the landscape has changed. Um, competition, we think, is a really important thing, unsurprisingly, um, as a driver for growth, innovation, investment, and what we've seen in digital um, markets is that a small number of digital firms have really unprecedented amounts of market power, which we think um, is stifling UK economic growth and making consumers worse off. And I shouldn't say we think, I should say we have the, the economic evidence, we've done our impact assessment, um, which, which has been published as well. Um, and, and we've seen this in markets. Digital markets have these specific characteristics that make them they make them vulnerable to, to what we call tipping, um, where someone can take all of the benefits of a market and can have um, substantial and entrenched market power, which means that it has impacts for productivity, it has impacts for small businesses and challenger firms' ability to enter the market and to, um, to, to get the best quality services. It also has um, impacts for consumers in terms of the, the innovation they have access to, in terms of the prices they have access to. Um, so that's why um, that's why we need to act. We're not saying that big is bad. We're not saying that to be a big digital firm is, is an inherently bad thing, but we do need to make sure that competition is working and that market power is not becoming entrenched in a way that reduces the benefits for the economy and for consumers. So what exactly we want to achieve with the new regime that's set out in the bill. Um, I think it's worth sort of highlighting the, the there are sort of four key elements of, of what we're trying to do. So the first thing is that we are designating certain firms with strategic market status. Um, so the measures are going to be targeted at a small number of firms um, which exert significant control over digital markets. And what the bill allows is for the CMA to carry out an investigation, so that's the Competition and Markets Authority, Competition and Markets Authority, carry out an investigation, work out whether these tests are met, 
And if the firm has substantial and entrenched market power and has a position of strategic significance in respect of one or more digital activities, then that firm can be designated. So that's sort of the, the gateway into the regime. That's, that's if you're in this new regulation. And it is really worth emphasising that none of these rules apply if you are not in the regime. This is a very targeted regime, as opposed to the general competition measures and the consumer measures in the rest of the bill. And so once you're in, um, there are essentially two main tools. One is conduct requirements, which are a tailor-made, um, based on consultation, based on evidence, rules that set out how firms with strategic market status must behave. Um, and then we have the possibility then uh, down the line to have pro-competition interventions, um, which are measures that the digital markets unit in the CMA will be able to introduce to tackle the underlying causes of, um, of these firms' market power. So that can include better access to data, more interoperability, and measures to improve consumer choice. And then the final thing to add is that once these firms have this designation, then they will need to report most of their mergers in advance to um, the CMA so that the CMA has advanced oversight of, of mergers that are coming down the line. doesn't make any changes at all to the merger regime generally, just that sort of information flow at the outset. Um, one thing I will just clarify from what I've just said, I know I've been talking a long time, um, I've been talking about the Competition and Markets Authority and the Digital Markets Unit. So um, I'm using the terms interchangeably. The Digital Markets Unit has already been set up, um, and this this new bill gives it gives it its powers, gives it its statutory powers. Um, it's it's a unit within the um, Competition and Markets Authority with the expertise and capability on digital markets. Indeed, thank you very much. I, I noticed that the, the DMU uh, has not been mentioned, explicit, mentioned explicitly in the bill, but it's probably, uh, we shouldn't try anything. So we know it's, it's already part of the CMA and we're talking about the CMA, which can organize its internal mechanics depending within within its competence. So it's just, you know, some people exactly. somehow spotted exactly. this as a kind of message. No. It's an internal structure, but we are, it, that doesn't reflect any lack of importance to the DMU. Great. It's just um, so I, I wanted maybe to ask a few rather technical uh, issues because when we talk about this paradigmatic reforms in, in the regulation of competition in digital markets, we usually contra or compare it with our sister regimes in, in the European Union and in some member states. We know that in, in Germany, they have their own section 19 uh, reform, section 19A, and we now in the UK have our own section 19 uh, related to the designation of <laughs> of, of, of these uh, undertakings with strategic market status. And what immediately somehow uh, appears when you read this, uh, this proposal is that while the discussion uh, over the last three years or so with uh, Fuhrman report, we used to call it Marston and Fletcher report, and uh, it's, uh, other, it's European equivalents, that we were talking about fairness and contestability. Um, if you look at the designation criteria, the objectives which it aims to kind of to achieve, the focus appears to be more on fairness than on contestability. Is it uh, just uh, illusionary uh, presumption, or it's not kind of thematically important to differentiate fairness and contestability? They are mutually supportive, or there was somehow clear cut decision to focus primarily on the on the elements of fairness rather than talking about fairness and contestability i don't i don't think it's fair to say that we have focused only on fairness or more on fairness than than contestability um as you say we um, are very aware of other regimes that are happening happening around the world and we can see a movement around the world towards tackling this specific issue um fairness and contestability are not the kind of two pillars. Um, they're not the words that we're using, but certainly both both elements very important to us. Um, I would say um, exactly as you say, they are they are mutually supportive. Having having fair rules of conduct um, 
is is not just about fairness to consumers and fairness to customers, but it's also fairness to competitors and fairness in terms of barriers to entry and exit. And that is exactly the same thing that creates contestability. Um, so I said I wouldn't sort of I wouldn't contrast those two things. And um, this is about creating competition for the uh, or sort of um, protecting competition for the ultimate benefit of consumers. Um, I would I would say perhaps um, we've got the conduct requirements, which are about the um, the the conduct that firms who are designated with um, strategic market status will need to follow. And we describe that as managing the effects of their market power. Um, so fairness is, is a big element of that, um, as as you'll be aware. Um, it's one of the one of the ty- one of the re- objectives that a conduct requirement can have, but it's not the only objective. Um, and then we also have this possibility for pro competition interventions, um, which are more about tackling the root causes of the market power. Um, so in a way that's designed to really build the competition into the market. So I think that both of those two things are very important. I think we expect the conduct requirements will come first because they will come at the point that the strategic market status designation is given. And then the pro-competition um, interventions will require an investigation. They need to be sort of fully fully, um, fully investigated in the proper way. Um, but both of them are really key aspects to this regime. Um, so I think that I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, uh, it does. Thank you very much, Matilda. So I, I, I wonder, there, there was no somehow uh, on the table two options with more emphasis on on or more equal uh, presence, explicit presence of, of these two objectives. Uh, it's it's something which it's just a matter of uh, pu- pure stylistics and l- 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 linguistic preferences with no somehow we shouldn't infer too much of internal meaning behind the, the facade, so to say, of, of the bill. Right. Okay. So and, and, and in, in this case, um, another emphasis in the discussions uh, about wh- why do we need such a new proactive uh, enforcement toolkit was that we want to speed up the process because usually the, 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 the digital cases, uh, it's important, hard digital cases last very long, particularly when in the digital world, the one year last few months, innovations are so, so quickly happening and it's really difficult to catch up. And often the, the complainants uh, though, or whistleblowers, those who identify the problem, uh, they basically, when the case is over, they, they disappear or they somehow change their business model and become less relevant, so to say. And that was somehow one of the purposes was to speed up the process. At first glance, um, when you look at the bill, it does appear to be quite, you know, uh, procedure focused, let's say. It, it, it envisages many procedural steps, which is important. A, from the perspective of rule of law, but B, I also had a kind of very preliminary chat with, uh, with some people from, from CMA, and they're happy. They say, no, 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 we don't see it as a problem. I did, actually. <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it's an optimistic message for me. I wanted to ask your opinion. Do you think it's it's moderate? It is uh, manageable in terms of, of procedural requirements? And was it also uh, something which you were considering in, in, in your dis- in discussion while designing the bill? Great, thanks very much. Um, I think it's absolutely right to be talking about to be talking about speed when we think about how fast these markets move. And um, we're not just thinking about speed in that we are thinking about iteration and iterativeness, iterativeness, being able to adapt an intervention to ensure that it's it's proportionate, it's limited, um, but also that if something doesn't work, that we can move it forwards. So it's got that element of being able to adjust. Um, and it's also ex ante. It also looks at um, looks at putting these conduct requirements, particularly, um, and the merger reporting requirements on firms in advance, rather than saying you've got to wait for something to go really, really wrong before we can we can make any intervention in the market. So um, it it it's it's not just about speed, but it is about speed. Um, I think what I would say in terms of the detail is that perhaps my experience of of working on draft legislation is that the nature of what we have to put down in legislation 
can end up feeling quite detailed and and um we because we need to set all of that out we need to make sure that the cma is properly accountable we need to be clear exactly what we ex- expect the process to be so that um sms firms have clarity the cma has clarity um and why the stakeholders have clarity about what's happening so i really i i would say that it might look very detailed because of the nature of the legislation rather than because the regime itself involves and um, I certainly don't think that the regime itself involves an excessive process and um, it's also worth saying I think that we thought it was really important to make sure that every aspect of the regime is evidence-based and future-proof so what we've done is we've set out processes that need to be carried out particularly in terms of consultation um, rather than having kind of blunt measurements where something applies or it doesn't apply or setting out specific conduct requirements on the face of the bill and on the face of the law Um, and so perhaps that does involve more process in terms of the CMA needing to decide what happens but what that does is it means that the the rules are tailor-made they are evidence-based and they're future-proof um, and that they're subject to consultation rather than setting them out in primary legislation now and forevermore. This sounds very convincing to me. Um, continuing this kind of analogy with, with, with what we have uh, with the DM, DM, DMA, what I noticed was uh, the very structure uh, of the DMA, of the this, uh, DMA task force and all, uh, uh, other directorates, new directorates, is that they are part and parcel of the commission, which is somehow can be comparable to the government, yeah, the European government, so to say it has it's hard to separate competition policy. We can separate it on the letter, on the paper, but in terms of how the, 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 the machinery functions, it's part of the broader digital vision or planning or kind of priority setting. And the, the communication between different interests, societal interests is much more natural. Whereas when you talk about national competition regimes uh, with competition authorities being not insulated, but somehow have an autonomous status from broader political agenda. Do, do you think this this format should continue within within this new uh, uh, regime for digital markets, or you would uh, expect uh, a broader communication uh, between the government and, in particular, your department and CMA, or also communication between CMA and other other digital regulators. I noticed that there are some references to communication between CMA and other and, and three other digital regulators. Can you elaborate on this, please? Um, yes, of course. I mean, I won't won't um, get into the questions of comparative structure of competition authorities um, as fascinating as they are. Um, but in terms of how the UK operates, the um, Competition and Markets Authority is an independent non-ministerial department. And um, so it's part of the UK government, but it's an independent regulatory authority, um, which gives it the right levels of, of autonomy and accountability um, to be able to make competition policy and as you and and your viewers will be very aware there are really good reasons to to take competition authority and to give it that level of independence and there are close relationships between the competition and markets authority and government and I would say those those relationships are particularly close when we're in the process of designing something new and so I previously worked on the subsidy control act um, as we were setting up the subsidy advice unit and the subsidy, that's something that needs quite a lot of close discussion. Um, and then when it comes more to cases, that's more about the Competition and Markets Authority getting on with things in a completely independent way. So there's never been there's never been a complete um, lack of communication between those two authorities. Um, and I think we will continue to discuss in terms of horizon scanning, um, in terms of, of being clear whether the um, the regulatory framework is fit for purpose and um, but when it comes to the casework of the competition and markets authority it, it is and will continue to be completely independent and not influenced by um political forces or by um civil servants working in in government departments like mine I, I see. Thank, thank you very much, Matilda, for this. Let us move back to the bill itself. And I, I, I wanted to have uh, uh, your view on uh, Section 29, namely the efficient, uh, efficiency defense, and more specifically, uh, the, the elegant phrase which is being used in the bill, 
contravenian benefits exemption. So um, it was another issue which, which, was, which was thematized by uh, the participants in the discussion about the need of the reform that um, when, when we talk about digital markets with gatekeepers or SMS as being so powerful, so competent, so skillful, and so uh, ready to meet all the requirements of consumers, their business users, and somehow shape them into the, to manage our choices and satisfy our choices so skillfully. And that was probably part of the reasons why they succeed on this, in this digital race, that it would be relatively easy for them to tick the box. However, to tick these four boxes, which are kind of designed from the, uh, the structure of, of one of three exception, exception for uh, you know, anti-competitive behavior, as we, uh, anti-competitive agreements, as we, as we, at least structurally, it looks very similar to me. So I wonder, uh, did, I know that it was from the very beginning, uh, th th there is nothing specific, particularly new about it. So I wonder, first, first of all, do you think that this model um, would, still allow the enforcer sufficient leverage, sufficient uh, flexibility in terms of intervening whenever they want, uh, rather than imposing such imperative mandate to somehow to justify and to be very cautious, very specifically responsible in terms of what they want to achieve, knowing in advance which measures will be uh, introduced is it is it something which which uh, is potentially problematic or it's purely a theoretical hypothetical imagination uh, which somehow drives us uh, uh, drives us towards kind of more skeptical side when we talk about efficiency defense or consumer welfare defense as far as uh, sms concern um, thanks yeah it's a it's a interesting part of the policy i think what it comes back to is that the the CMA, the Digital Markets Unit, Unit's objective is to promote competition for the benefit of consumers. And um, that has been a long-standing objective of the Competition and Markets Authority. And this needs to shape the design of all its regulatory interventions. So we absolutely recognise that big tech firms, the firms that, that will have strategic market status, offer many benefits to consumers, and we want to preserve these as far as possible. Um, so that's one of the elements that's included in the legislation to make it clear that the digital markets unit does need to take those benefits into account. Um, another one is that um, conduct requirements must not prevent um, these firms from developing innovations which are beneficial for consumers. Um, so we, we absolutely recognise that. Um, so if there is a, an investigation for a breach of a, a conduct requirement, then one of the firm, the firm will be able to put forward evidence that their action brings about benefits for consumers that outweigh the potential harm to competition, which engages this exemption, this countervailing benefits exemption. Um, so the CMA, um, we think that will um, does have the this does strike the balance to give the CMA the proper powers here. So the CMA will need to be satisfied that the criteria are met, um, and that includes making sure that the benefits could not be achieved through less anti-competitive conduct, and that's the word indispensability that we've included in the legislation. So we do think it strikes the right balance and is one of the many reminders that this regime is ultimately there for consumers. Um, and and that's what we're trying to achieve with it. Which kind of lead, leads us to the fairness point, uh, rather than contestability. Yeah, I, I, and look, when I look at the wording of, of the section 29, uh, 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 one specifically, I acknowledge uh, uh, having a little background, how sophisticated the, the, the letter of the law is that CMA must close a conduct investigation uh, so it's a duty to close if, um, if, if, there are, if, if this evidence has been presented that leads the CMA to consider that the prevailing benefits exemption applies. So it's, it, it's not a discretion to, to, to do this cost-benefit analysis, over, which leads us back to the more to, to economic uh, to economic analysis, marketing, uh, you know, uh, um, focused discussions rather than policy driven and I see the point why why the, the, the priority is given to this. But in terms of the duty to close investigation, do you think it will, the vocabulary is too imperative or it's 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 if the if the if the benefits are there, 
it's a duty of the CMA to, to refrain from, interve from intervening. Exactly that. This is um, this is a very specific exemption, and it's it's not something that that will always come into play. Um, but if there are countervailing consumer benefits that meet this test, um, then it absolutely is the duty of the CMA to close the investigation. Right, because what we again speaking of the DMA, uh, uh, the majority of promoters of the DMA regime. They were against any rationale of efficiency defense, be it phrased in the vocabulary of consumer welfare or any other countervailing uh, benefits. And uh, it looks that we will have to, to observe the, the practicality of two different modalities. So far, you know, we can hear that people are divided like 50-50. Many support one model uh, and many support another. Um, so the, the time will, will demonstrate uh, uh, to us which, which one works better. Uh, and I really look forward to it. Um, if I'm speaking of uh, pro-competitive interventions, if I may uh, shift our attention to section 44, again, being too excited probably with the vocabulary of pro pro more new pro-competition regime for digital markets. So when, when we talk in theoretical discussion, the, the, the idea of pro-competition intervention envisages uh, not a restorative, uh, restorative elements, not to somehow to, to bring the infringement or non-compliance to the end, but rather market design, which is a very new um, duty of, of the of competition regulator, which is very problematic and challenging duty. And it looks to me that the vocabulary of pro-competition intervention has been preserved in the bill, but the substance uh, of section, uh, section 44, power to make uh, pro-competition intervention is dressed in the vocabulary of more restorative um, uh, situation. So we want, we, we want uh, with, uh, with this pro-competition intervention to remedy, mitigate, or prevent the adverse effect on competition. So, and as long as the adverse effects on competition are prevented or even mitigated, this pro-competition regime is supposedly uh, doing its job. Can I, can I ask your opinion? Is, do, do I put too, too, too much into this pro-competition terminology or uh, that, that, that's an issue, it's, it's in intentional choice? The essential point of the pro-competition intervention is to um, is to tackle the root causes of market power. So it's not necessarily restorative. It's not trying to wind the clock back. It's not trying to say um, we need to we need to restore a situation that was in the market however many years ago because the technology has improved, the innovation has improved, and so on. And and it's it's difficult to disentangle that. So this is about interventions in the market that support support competition. That's what we mean by pro-competition. Um, we do need to see an adverse effect on competition to put a pro-competition in, intervention in place. And, and that's because um, these these interventions can do um, fairly significant things in terms of how they how they structure the markets and the requirements that they put on SNS firms. Um, so, so we do need to see we do need to see the adverse effect, um, but it's about tackling those root causes rather than rather than winding the the clock back. So the terminology of of pro competition is about saying these are these are interventions that are designed to bolster competition with the within the market and tackle the root causes of the SMS firms market power. Right, so uh, maybe it would make sense also to look at other uh, original and innovative elements of, of the bill. And we know that in Australia, uh, the, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission uh, was very active in, in designing uh, the new kind of bargaining code where they, they were trying to somehow to synchronize the interests of, of content owners uh, and uh, digital platforms with, with, with thinking about the mechanism which we could reconcile the, these antagonistic uh, positions in many respects. And they were talking about the, in this bargaining code about, about the mechanism how to uh, arbitrate the, the, the price which platforms pay to content owners. 
it looks that the, the, that, that your department went even further with, with, with this proposal and it's it, that the mechanism of final offer can be used for all this front uh, fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory issues or maybe for some elements of compensating unfair prices. Uh, can you elaborate on, on the logic of final offer uh, as, as envisaged in, in, in the bill, please? Um, the final offer mechanism, it's worth noting that this is really a um, something that comes into play in very specific and limited circumstances. It is a universal mechanism in terms of the sectors, so it's not specific to press, it's not specific to any sector. Um, what it is, is if a firm um, is in breach of a conduct requirement that relates specifically to fair payment, then um, as part of resolving that, and instead of the CMA or the digital markets unit trying to actually set prices, what they can do is to require both the SMS firm and the firm that's, that's disputing the price, they can require them both to, um, to put in a proposed fair price into the, into the into the CMA, and then the CMA picks one of the two offers. It's not a price regulator. The CMA is not setting a price. Um, it's designed to be used in really limited circumstances. Um, so it's, it's only if you have a situation where there's a dispute over a conduct requirement that's specifically related to fair prices, and, um, and it is available there as one of the tools in the CMA's toolkit um, to adjust that situation. Um, and to avoid a situation in which there's kind of ongoing ongoing haggling with the CMA, it's that both parties put in one offer, one final and best offer, and then the CMA chooses between the two. Excellent. I think it answers my question. And actually, they, they, they borrow this, uh, you borrow this elegant formula designed uh, by the, the ACCC, where you don't step this imaginary line becoming price regulator. You just arbitrate which one. Uh, is uh, more reasonable and uh, hopefully the situations for kind of uh, for, for this um, unfair pricing will be uh, rare but maybe it will be a good a good opportunity for to, to avoid this laborers ping pong of, of what is fair what is reasonable this this appears to be a very solomonic solomonic judgment in its in its essence i wonder what would be uh, what would your crystal ball tell us about the the, 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 the next months? How how should how should the the game be played? Uh, now the bill is in the parliament. What would be the typical uh, maybe calendar plan or at least some uh, framework which we which we should take into consideration while preparing our papers on on, on this on this reform? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you what the normal legislative procedure is. So, um, what the way that it works is a, a bill in the UK has to go through both houses of parliament and be agreed by both houses of parliament in order to pass into law. Um, so we have first reading, which is when the bill is published. We've just had that last week. Um, then, um, in usually at least two weeks. Um, and often longer, we have second reading, which is the first debate um, in the um, in Parliament. And this bill has been introduced into the House of Commons, so obviously the first debate is going to be in the House of Commons. Um, then generally it starts at least two weeks after that. Um, we will have committee stage, which is um, when a smaller group of MPs will go line by line through the whole of the bill, um, and the minister will be there and uh, answering questions. Um, and um, putting forward the, um, his case um, in, in, in our two ministers, our, our big men, um, putting forward his case to on, on why the bill should continue as it is. Um, and other um, MPs will be tabling amendments to the bill at that stage. Um, after that, we have another big debate um, and another opportunity for amendments to go through, and that's the vote um, for the whole of the House um, before it goes, so that's report stage and third reading. Um, so the committee sort of reports back to the whole house. Um, and then the bill will go as amended at that stage to, um, if, if there are any amendments at all, to the House of Lords. The same thing happens in the House of Lords. And then we have the stage um, called ping pong, um, which is where the, um, if the amendments have been made in the House of Lords, the House of Commons has to consider them and vice versa until both houses have agreed and passed the same version of the bill. 
Um, after that, we have royal assent, which is when the king um, will will sign the the bill into law and the bill becomes an act. Um, and then usually a couple of months after that, or at least a couple of months after that, that is when the um, the act comes into force. Um, so all that all of that is to say that the normal course of things, if it's not an urgent bill, which this isn't, um, that really does take quite a number of months. Um, so there's no need to there's no need to um, <laughs> um, panic and expect that competition law is going to change tomorrow. Um, so it's just worth keeping an eye on Parliament, seeing how how it goes through. Um, it's at least a number of months, but it can take quite a lot longer than that. Um, so um, hopefully, hopefully, at some time in in the coming months, we see the new digital markets. Um, Competition and Consumers Act. Matilda, we have this uh, practice uh, of uh, ending conversation with asking our guests maybe to provide some suggestions for students. Maybe working uh, on, on this bill, you have noticed some uh, areas of law and policy which uh, where there are some gaps and new competences, new blood would be particular of particular demand. So we can channel. We can channel our students in this direction. But before doing this, I wanted to thank you for for for, for working so hard uh, on on this proposal. It's such a heated uh, topic. So such so 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 many different stakeholders interpret every letter of this provision in in different directions. So I imagine it must be really entertaining from purely juristic point of view, but also very very demanding endeavor. And we we uh, you know the competition communities. Uh, we're very grateful for, for the opportunity for giving us a new food for, for, for thinking about it. But let us move now to the recommendations. Did you identify any specific areas or specific uh, skills which are particular demand uh, and will be in the, in, the, in the following years? I think this is going to continue to be a really fascinating area. I think that, um, I mean, we have taken a lot of steps and very much hope that this is a future-proof regime so um so perhaps um um perhaps we we definitely hope that we won't need any more primary legislation on this but it's certainly a fascinating area to go and work in the competition and markets authority on and um, combining that kind of technical expertise of of how digital works how digital markets work um, with a more traditional understanding of markets and consumers. Um, I have certainly found working in government as a civil servant, it's the most exciting thing is when you get to work on something where you were drawing graphs in A-level economics and you think, oh, whether it's price discrimination or, or oligopoly models, and you think, ah, I see, now that's my job. And so I would um, certainly for, for students who are staying on a more academic path, um, keep holding us to account, keep looking at all of this because it's so interesting. The markets are so fast moving and, and no one quite knows what's going to happen. Um, and I would also really encourage students to think about working for the civil service, um, whether that's in economic policy in, in central departments, um, like the Department for Business and Trade and the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, um, but also in the Competition and Markets Authority, because I think there are really exciting career opportunities there and um, lots of lots of pathways in um, that are um, accessible um, and supportive of, of lots of different kinds of people um, and, and lots of different um, skills, capabilities and needs. So I would certainly encourage you to, to look at the civil service as a career path. Matilda Cortez, thank you very much for, for finding time and giving us some compass uh, which will help us to navigate in this, in this uncharted world or in this labyrinth of, of, of digital markets regulation. Um, it was a great opportunity to, to ask this, some basic questions about the, the bill, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss it further in the following years uh, when the, 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 the mechanisms start functioning in, as, as envisaged. Absolutely, I look forward to that.